Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tobias. Um, I'm an early stage technology investor currently based in Singapore. Um, I'm with the firm called Blockchain Founders Fund, which I joined about two and a half years ago, very early on and sort of been driving, um, you know, sort of early stage investment in, in China um, in the very beginning, but now a bit more across Southeast Asia and also from a global perspective. And what we're going to talk about today is really focusing on startup ecosystems across China and Southeast Asia, and more in particular about really the key developments, especially in early stage investment landscape uh, across dimension markets, because um, there are some couple of changes which are happening right now on a very fast pace, uh, which have been built up in China and now sort of slowly trickled into the Southeast Asia region as well. And I think uh, that's a very interesting topic to cover, both interesting for startups and founders, but also interesting for, for investors. We're looking into that space um, just because it is it is really, really fast moving and, and extremely fast developing. Um, I think the first point I want to start with, I want to just give a quick background of, sort of what we're doing um, and, and take that time to sort of set, set the baseline for that. Um, like I said, I'm with Blockchain Founders Fund. We started about two and a half years ago. We've always been focusing on very early stage startups between the pre-series uh, or sort of the pre-seed round to pre-series A round. We look at especially emerging technology, which has been a big focus on the blockchain space, on the crypto space as well, but also just uh, you know emerging technology, which comprises of artificial intelligence, machine learning um, across across the across the world. Uh, I myself have been working both in in the, in the operator side as well as on the on the investment side um, across China, Thailand, Cambodia, and, and Southeast Asia. Um, so hopefully you can can add some value today. Up to date, we have invested actually about 55 or almost 60 companies now across six continents. We have invested in, in six companies in the MENA region as well. Uh, and we have a new fund coming out of Singapore right now, which is about $75 million. $75 million. And over the next couple of years, we're going to do about 200 more investments um, across the mentioned stages and across the mentioned um, technology categories. We do already have a, a crypto unicorn, which we're very proud of. It's called Splinterlands. It's together with Axie Infinity in the play to earn space. The gaming side, now one of the leading companies on a global scale. Um, and yeah, we hope to find many more. Um, so yeah, happy to get in touch with any interesting founders. If we look at early stage investing, there's a couple of interesting criteria I want to point out just because it's very different from you know, investing in a Series B, Series C company or even at the pre-IPO stages where a lot of bigger investors with, with remarkable names in, in the industry come in. Because typically when you invest in early stage companies, you just don't necessarily have all the financial data on hand. Right? So we have invested in pre-revenue, pre-product companies where there's not much more than the vision um, founders and, and you know, just a, a pitch deck with a go-to-market strategy and you know, a, a product in an MVP stage or in a, in a beta mode. So obviously you need to have a very different viewpoint on that, right? And, and the same thing is for founders, when you're looking for early stage investors, I think it's really important to have the right strategic investors on board, who of course can give you the financial resources, but also on the other hand, are able to give you more the strategic resources and build connections into interesting areas or industries. You might not have um, the perfect you know, connections or, or, um, or, or network within that space. So for us, it's always important to be founder oriented, which means that the founder's background, the founder's vision, and of course the founder's knowledge in that space is one of the most important things we look at. And, and that's a, a big part of every first conversation we're having with startups. It's just understanding why they're building this, right? Why are they going into um, the, the very uh, difficult route of being a founder and especially in emerging markets, which is might, might be even, even challenging uh, um, because not a lot of infrastructures are being built yet. Of course, that differs between China and Southeast Asia. We're looking for innovation risk because even in early stage startups, you, are, you need to be better than your competitors, right? Especially if you go into an area where there's already been a lot of competition. It's really about um, figuring out how to be better, how to be more innovative, how to be faster um, to go ahead and, and, and jump the curve. Founders need to be determined, coachable, flexible, passionate. That's all great, great words, but um, it is just an important factor just because we want to be close with the founders. We want to help them, support them. And, and of course, you know, the founder 
is an, is an expert in his, in his niche, in his industry, in his space. But sometimes an outside perspective from a fund point of view, we see a lot of different business models might even give, give a good hint or a good, good next path moving forward. In the end, um, I think early stage is just key to look for the underlying problem which has been solved. Right? What is the real problem? What is, what, is, what is the issue in the market and why are you allowed to be in that market to say it very harsh, right? What is your secret sauce essentially to exactly penetrate that, that, that problem? Is your go-to-market strategy feasible, right? And, and I hear this a lot from a lot of different investors is of course, financial models are interesting for early stage investors as well, but it's more from an assumption perspective. And if I see that your assumptions make sense, then I know that you have thought through, right? You, have, you, have a, you understand the market, you understand certain metrics which are common um, and you're sort of grounded in that, in that regard that, that you not know, have you know, crazy assumptions which might not be happening and, and then always lead to that kind of hockey stick model and in, in valuations in early stage startups where they're gonna grow 100X and so on and so forth um, moving forward. Um, and I, again, the last point is what I mentioned here is, and that's especially important for founders. Like if you're a founder and you have a certain vision in mind, right? Maybe, maybe not every founder wants to be the next unicorn. Uh, maybe some want, but it's important to understand the right fund you're choosing because every fund has to make fund economics work, which means they have to make a certain return on their money um, if it's a financial driven, driven fund. Um, so it's important to understand which fund actually makes sense and it's aligned with my vision so I can grow as sort of I want to or the business needs to without getting pushed into certain directions, um, just because certain you know, exit strategies, timelines, or money multiples are expected from, from you as a founder and your startup. The approach is, is challenging <laughs> because as an investor and the same as a founder, um, you always lack their circles, right? So as a founder, it's hard to get attention from, from venture capital fund just because you don't you're not able to show a lot of traction at that moment and you need capital to show that traction. So that's like the kind of circle in itself. Of course, if you have been, if you have done a reputation in the space, you've had previous exits, then you probably have a great network we can tap into, but especially first time founders, they, change, they have a, the, the same sort of challenging approach. But also from a, from a venture capital perspective or from an investor side of view, um, it is difficult to find early stage startups, especially when you look at them because typically when a startup seeks investors' money, they already reach some certain stages, right? Because before they have family friends rounds, they probably have angel rounds or get a grant or, or join accelerators in, in that regard, um, where, where it's not always that easy to get access. So tapping into those founder circle, provide more than capital, provide that hands-on money as I call it, which is actually an interesting point, but there's money, obviously there's smart money and I call it hands-on money which is the next step where I think VCs and as more sophisticated investors will go to, which essentially means that you as an investor are really get your hands dirty and help those help the growth and help the, finders, uh, the founders drive the, the, the business forward. Um, I like the strategy of especially early stage, starting off with a smaller ticket size, let's say 100, 200K. And then once you work with your portfolio companies and you see how they hit milestones and how they hit deadlines and how they work and how everything performs, then you double down and, and put larger checks in a company to prevent dilution, but also to, to keep um, building that vision you're looking into. Invest in what you understand. I think that that becomes very obvious in the current crypto and blockchain space. Everybody wants to get in, but um, not everybody is, is completely 100% aware of what's happening. Um, and, but again, here, um, do your research um, and, and just really understand sort of what, you, what you're tapping into. Now, going a little bit away from the pure investment perspective, um, I love to touch on firstly on the on the ASEAN or or even a bit, bit smaller, maybe we can we can say Southeast Asia. Um, ASEAN is 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 a is a tremendous market, but Southeast Asia itself is also a, a really huge market. Um, and there's a lot of development happening in these markets. And I, I put down a, a couple of key figures which I think are are interesting to to understand and to keep in mind. All right, so first of all, the population is about seven hundred million. Uh, that's that's bigger than the US, that's bigger than Europe. That's a tremendous market of, of people who are young, right? And who are, who are driven and who all have access to smartphones and internet and cheap data or relatively cheap data. If you compare it to India, one of the cheapest data in the world, 
um, same as Cambodia, where I lived about 10 months um, and really explored that market. It's fascinating to see how, how fast that, that technology side of things is driving and how many doors it has opened to both businesses, but also to consumers. Um, in Asin alone, there are about 575 million internet users, which is a tremendous market. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of economic contribution, which can be resolved or partly resolved through, through technology. And where of course, FinTech recently exploded just because a lot of people have no credit score, no credit history, and therefore unable to have a bank account. And with, with certain companies who enable you know, wallets, for example, where you can top up through an agent network, pay fast is an interesting example. Um, there's Click out of Cambodia, which is an interesting example, where they really enable people to join a digital wave and pay um, without cash, which was again, driving, you know, a bit driver during COVID because people were afraid to touch, um, you know, real money because essentially it's, it could be transmission um, of, of a disease. Now, I think right now, obviously, the GDP per capita in all these countries is 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 still growing. It's it's relatively low in some of them, but it is it is expected to be around seven k, um, which is a similar journey as as China has been going through, which I'm going to mention in a couple of minutes. And that will increase um, or has a tremendous impact on consumer spending. And consumer spending is has been driving e-commerce, it's been driving a lot of even GDP in the end, um, where we have about 2.7 trillion consumer spending, which is you know basically driven by 70% of the middle class uh, once they reach it, uh, that they will have a lot more access to, to capital contributing to the economy and making a circular economy work. Um, and again, like just summarizing what, what essentially is happening in, in C or more broadly in ASEAN is that growth is driven by a one favorable dem demographics. Um, people is very young. Um, you have increasing urbanization where people want to go into cities, work and, and sort of join disruptive technologies. People are leapfrogging. If you use that, that overused word going from having no access, um, you know, not going to a check, not going to a credit card, they're going directly to mobile first and use the phone to pay at you know, food shops, mom and pop shops and all these things. Then you have improved infrastructure, which is also a lot driven by governance. Just one example is Cambodia. Again, they, they increased uh, or they, they introduced Bakong, which is a blockchain based payment switch where essentially you're able to send money within the country um, for, for zero costs to different banks. If you compare this to Indonesia right now, um, making a bank, tra bank transfer is about 50 cents. Uh, that's basically the question, should I transfer money or should I buy a bowl of rice? Right, that's, that makes a tremendous impact in, in some other people's lives. And, and then again, the last point, which is also partly government driven, is streamlined regulatory frameworks, which enables you to build on, on certain infrastructures, legal infrastructure, which makes making business or joining that, that tech reform a lot more safer and organized. I think here is a, is a very interesting point. And I think if, if you have lived in, in Southeast Asia, um, you probably came across uh, those this this green color um, between Grab and GoJack, which you know sort of introduced ride hailing and the gig economy towards the, this market, um, which been driven by people got got smartphones. People are able to to join, and people need to go from A to B. And there's sometimes not a perfect public transport system in place, and that allows people to now have food delivery. Um, have have that sort of part part of the gig economy, which has been introduced by Uber or um, DD in all these places in China. Now, the interesting part is that these companies started off pretty basic in sense of technology, but they're now all layering um, more more services on top of it, which is which makes it very sophisticated. Right when Grab pivoted into become um, a digital bank, essentially with a payment wallet where people can use Grab Pay or Pay Fast or Shopee Pay now even. Um, to, 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 join, to join the digital transformation. And that's all been obviously driven by consumers, right? Consumers join um, the internet, they get access to internet, which increases their resources tremendously to both knowledge, but also just understanding what's happening, which then also makes them much more sophisticated and much more that much more higher standards, which then makes it hard for businesses and especially small and medium-sized businesses to join that tech journey 
just because they don't have all these these mechanisms in place, right? You can obviously order from Shopee and you do that, um, but the small mom and pop shop, which has been working well, is kind of left outside. And then the whole B2B side exploded and, and a lot of startups in the tech space wanted to help them and, and came up with great, great, um, great mechanism and great products to help those small and medium-sized businesses digitalize and join that ride and actually service the consumers much better. And, and that's been sort of happening in Southeast Asia. And again, that's been driven by all these favorable um, topics. A couple of key success factors as I want to call them, right? You have obviously key markets here in the region. Um, I'm going to exclude China for now because it's a separate topic. But the three markets are essentially Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, just because they are very, they have a lot of people, the population is very high, they're very young, um, and they all sort of want to join this development. And it's the GDP per capita is increasing. Uh, and then certain countries are building, building a hub, right? Thailand is now more or less the blockchain and crypto hub, which together with Singapore, obviously. But Singapore reached some certain maturity that you know these very early stage infrastructure B2B and B2C companies that have been here for a long time. Right? They're, not, they're not changing anything accordingly. Um, so it's a very different landscape, um, but, but still very interesting. Key industries are, you know, obviously FinTech because there's a huge unbanked population. If you looked at Philippines, I think more than 70% don't have a bank account. Um, at tech, because, you know, schools are closed essentially right now. I mean, it's getting better, but people look for other ways to reskill themselves, especially since new jobs are being created. And a lot of jobs with, you know, our future kids are going to have, or, you know, the next generation will be having they don't even exist yet, right? So there's a, a huge upskilling going to be needed in a couple of years, where of course the access to education through technology is 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 a is breaking the barriers quite a bit. E-commerce, um, you know, joining that wave has been a tremendous success, and now with that being sort of familiar in those markets, the actually direct to consumer where people are or social commerce as you want to call it, is coming into play where people now use. WhatsApp, Facebook, um, and just becomes a much more social driven aspect in terms of purchasing, in terms of influencing, but also in terms of promoting. Um, gaming is, is, is something which is, um, especially blockchain gaming, which blew up extremely in the region, especially if you look at the Philippines where Axie Infinity um, helped people generate two to three times more income than their regular job. Um, the same is for, for other markets as well, even Splinterlands. Um, sort of you know been, been been very strong in those markets as well and that that's been again then um, accelerating the whole b2b space that they can keep up with those trends key operations i mentioned before is really about building networks right it's about giving those companies fundraising support understanding where the talent is coming from and all these big unicorns we have in the region now are definitely a great catalyst for talent where the former you know had a global business or head of VD from GoJag is now starting his own company. I'm mean, just giving a random example, but like it's really building those talent of helping them and showing them how to scale a company towards a billion dollar valuation and above. And then they probably have interesting ideas, have a good education, a good knowledge and go ahead and do it themselves again, which then provides a, a great, great support for the ecosystem. I think from an investor point of view as a key strategy, it's really about using a lot of technology also in your deal sourcing process. Uh, because you need to be faster. You need to look at more places. It's not just Silicon Valley anymore. It's not just Singapore anymore, where great companies are coming above. It's really about building those networks, building these connections. Um, and for example, we build a corporate and the expert network where we have a lot of people who we work very hands-on and close with to, to find deals in, in you know, every corner of the world. Um, and that's been helping us to find extremely interesting companies and hopefully we'll be moving forward. Quickly, Blockchain Southeast Asia, just because your blockchain fund, and I think it's just been so hot these days and a lot of venture capital funds and a lot of founders are now going into that space. Um, I think obviously from a transaction and payment perspective, it's very interesting just because you have a lot of international remittance. You have a lot of people who are sending money from A to B, from Singapore to the Philippines and back. Um, digital identity, authentication and security is becoming very interesting also from a governance perspective, um, government perspective, as in Singapore, for example, with SingPass and all these things. Even degrees are now uh, on a blockchain, for example, Singapore, uh, NUS and SMU in Singapore are now offering the degrees on the blockchain. 
And then you have the whole social networking, gaming, social mining, play to earn, where people actually generate real money by doing what they like to do um, or, or consider fun. From an infrastructure perspective, I think it gets uh, a lot more sophisticated. I mentioned Barkong in Cambodia, similar arrangements have been done in Thailand or in Indonesia. Of course, Singapore has been on the forefront of that as well with very um, good regulations to, to offer such companies and you know a home in Singapore. DeFi, it's, been, it's, it's early for sure. Um, there are more exchanges coming up, um, you know, especially trading solutions here in Singapore have been, been interesting, um, but, but it's, uh, it's coming. Um, and I think, first of all, we need to build infrastructures and, and um, you know, open up because there's so much demand and need, especially in the crypto space here in, in Southeast Asia, that there will be a, a very hot market moving forward. What's now driving the VC space here? I think it's, a, it's, about, it's essentially six points. The first one is really tech-driven deal sourcing. Right? Did you use machine learning, use um, artificial, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence in your, in your due diligence process? Great examples, um, actually in Germany and the US is early bird venture capital. Um, they're doing fantastic in that space. Bloomberg Beta with their future founder program. Um, we're actually predicting who might be a, might be a founder which in my opinion reduces a big problem because the way we've been sourcing deals in VC was in my opinion, based on a lot of bias as well and screening, right? Because the partners have a network, typically you reach out, um, you know, there's only certain deal flow you, you will receive and, and some other founders who might not have access to that, to that type of pe prepared people, they are basically been left out. And I think um, of course, machine learning and artificial intelligence is not perfect in terms of bias, but I think uh, I definitely support um, moving forward. Um, one of the most interesting things is, and I think that's sort of what makes everything even more complicated and, and better at the same time, is that you have the democratization of information. Right? Before you needed to go to a specific place, like a library to get your information, right? or you need to get an event to go and, and understand. But now you have LinkedIn, right? you have TechCrunch, you have AngelList, you have Crunchbase, right? You have all these resources where information is essentially available, right? It's just about how to categorize, organize it, and then use it to your to your advantage in terms of um, both from a founder perspective and, of course, from a, from an investor perspective as well. You see a lot more localization of funds. You see a lot more um, smart money being pumped in the market or hands-on market money, uh, as I call it. Because you know, if you're a great startup currently, you don't have a problem getting exposure to the venture capital world. There's a lot of money in the market. I mean, yes, it's not perfectly distributed yet. And most of the funding goes into the later stage rounds of already um, good performing late stage startups. But it's still, um, there's a lot of funds coming in, especially Southeast Asia. A lot of US funds are coming in and really building up their offices and their standpoint here because they know that it's gonna be a, a, an interesting market moving forward and already interesting market. There'll be a lot of true innovation coming out of here. No more copycats. Um, as sort of you've seen the Chinese revolution here in, in Southeast Asia, everything which kind of blew up in China was then um, rebuilt here in Southeast Asia and it worked, but now you actually have things which coming out of Southeast Asia, which is a, a true innovation profile. Founders have become more local. You're gonna have more first generation local successful founders rather than only foreigners or people who have lived abroad and studied there and came back with an interesting idea. For example, Grab and Gojek were both the same case. Um, and you will see alternative ways of, of actually raising money, right? You have crowdfunding, you will have um, the whole tokenization point of view and you have SPACs, right? Um, which helps you to go public earlier um, and just bring more liquidity into the market, hopefully, because that's still something which, which we're lacking in that industry or in that part of the world. Now, moving a little bit away from the Southeast Asia side, I wanna go into China just because it is definitely a, a bit of an interesting and a very different point um, China has been, you know, growing tremendously over the last years, and it's it, it will be transforming, or it also has on the agenda to be transforming into a technology powerhouse, and it's driven by 1.4 billion people, um, 33 trillion estimated total GDP. Um, you know, 70% is urban population. You have about a billion smartphone users. You have cheap data. Um, you know, you have a lot of 5G users in 2030, and that's actually pretty crazy in my opinion, you have almost everyone in the country using 5G, 
right? That's like literally in yeah, a couple of years from now. Um, average zero capita will increase tremendously as well, which will then have an effect on consumer spending, which will then increase the market even further. But one thing is to say, and I worked in China myself as a startup and as an investor, or with a startup as an investor, it is a very difficult market to tackle, especially for foreign companies, just because the market is extremely challenging. It's, it's very, the expectations are very high. Um, consumers are very demanding and the competition is extremely fierce. Uh, that's why you see a lot of companies and there's big companies like eBay who never really try to have an anchor. They never ran a channel to an anchor in China. Um, and, you know, companies like Alibaba, Tencent, you know, all the big ones essentially are taking over a huge part of the market and, and, and Chinese customers are just using services and products very different um, than a Western part would do. What's driving essentially in, in China? It's technology, right? And I don't know if, uh, who has been to China before, but I've never used cash, right? I only paid with WeChat and Alipay and, and all, these, all these payment apps and everybody is doing it, right? And like you can go to any shop basically and you will see um, all, all these QR codes hanging out and people can use it and people are using it. Um, and that's, that's, that's bringing tr transparency in the market. I mean, um, and it also, um, you know, really shifts this country to a mobile first generation. And if you don't have a mobile phone in China, you can almost not participate in the economy anymore if you want to put it in a very, very hard scale. Um, but there's also a bunch of other stuff which is happening on the semiconductor side, which I think is very interesting to mention. It's because we never talk about hardware companies, right? I mean, and most of the focus is on, on software businesses, but for every chip you do, for every device you make, you essentially need semiconductors. And the US was leading, and the US is leading in that market. Um, but China has a tremendous appetite for these products in order to produce technology, in order to give a billion people um, devices um, across China. And of course, with more um, uh, discretionary income, people will consume more devices and con will consume more data and will be more exposed to mobile and internet. And that's what China is heading to, of really becoming a leader in that space. Um, it's already a cashless society. I mentioned that. I mean, a lot of people are in middle class um, and you have a lot of companies who are become tremendous big and looking to invest and, and buy assets outside of China to really bring that vision. And I think China's government is, is doing a good job in that regard of really, um, you know, moving that tech, tech reform forward. Key drivers, again, just quickly highlight a couple of things. There's a couple of key industries. Um, so of course, artificial intelligence is something China has always been um, investing highly in it and then moving forward, the same as robotics and self-driving cars um, and all these things are, are, just, are just blowing up. Um, in media, even the film market, um, China uh, has done a tremendous job on, on competing in that way as well to making sophisticated movies, which are now ending up in, in Western movie theaters. Um, a lot of startups also happening in that space. The whole social commerce, which in my opinion is extremely interesting um, just because there's so much happening. If you look at like Pinduoduo, for example, or like all these other platforms, there's so much power behind all these users who share opinions, who share updates about what's happening, what products to buy, what products not to buy. And it's very, very easy to actually ruin your reputation, right? As a product, because you have so much exposure and you're so transparent in terms of how people write about you and talk about you. Um, so keeping that relationship with your customer, focusing on customer, be, being customer oriented, and just like keep up with like this fast moving, ever responding um, sort of movement is, is something which is, which is fascinating. And it gives a whole lot of power and a whole different place of marketing, which makes challenging to go in these traditional marketing rounds for, for big conglomerates um, moving forward. 5G's ahead and of course, smartphones capability expand. Consumption is, is getting higher. I think I mentioned this before. And what I really want to emphasize, and I think I saw that um, also like in Japan, for example, and I think it's growing in Southeast Asia, Singapore is, is, is in a similar stage, in my opinion, that very consumer-oriented penetration strategy. Uh, we talked to a lot of uh, companies who want to tap into China or startups who want to tap into China and, and look at the market 
obviously because it is a fascinating market. It's a huge market um, and one of the biggest markets in the world, but it's just so hard to enter because you need to have a very, you need to understand the consumer very, very well in China and still be able to compete with a massive um, sort of more or less isolated economy in a sense where most of the businesses are just penetrating China alone because the market is big enough to do that. Right? In Singapore, you can't, it's because the market only has 5 million people. It's hard to become a unicorn within Singapore. You need to expand to other markets and other cities. But China, you can easily become a unicorn if you capture a small fraction of a 1.4 billion people market who are essentially all going to who essentially all going to have a phone in a couple of years from now. Uh, key trends to watch, in my opinion, is definitely um, from a logistic perspective, from a supply chain perspective, and kind of like driving, driving globalization. There's already a lot of trade coming in um, with the Ida Ilula One Belt One Road initiative that will even increase. Um, China is focusing a lot of better environmental protection, greenhouse startups in the green, um, you know, sort of zero emission space are, are growing up, same as energy vehicles, self-driving cars, all these things. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's going to be the direction moving forward. That And, and I think, um, yeah, it's already been progressing quite, quite fast. I think blockchain in, in China is an interesting topic as well. I mean, we, I mean, just one thing, blockchain and crypto, obviously, I mean, everybody who speaks about crypto means blockchain, everyone's blockchain means crypto, but essentially these are like two different things. I mean, not necessarily, but part of each other. Um, you can have a blockchain, but not a crypto component. Um, and especially in the B2B space, right? when, you, when you just look at the core, what, an essentially, what the blockchain essentially does is in terms of effectiveness, ease, like replacing middleman, making things more transparent. Um, from a trust perspective, there's a lot of areas you can tap into when you have a blockchain component, right? You can look in banking, of course. Uh, you can look at in governmental services, agriculture, healthcare, digital identity. Uh, and, and China is really driving the blockchain adoption across 18 verticals, 108 scenarios, right? I mean, it, it really, I saw a recent interesting article. They say it's the age of blockchain 3.0 where you go from very limited application points to actually having an application in almost every industry. Right? When you have a, in the supply chain, obviously in trade finance, a lot of tracing, uh, asset allocation, um, you have peer to peer energy trading, where you just wanna have faster and smoother processes where record is being made, which can't be tempered with. And uh, there's a lot of, essentially it's solving human trust issues as we call it, right? Um, and, and I think that's where blockchain is going to find its use case. Um, and, and I think that's where China's doing a great job. Um, and and they, they have a few points about crypto as well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we will see how, how the future plays out here in, 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 the, in the China region, I mean, in China. China development and emerging technology, just to round this up. Um, yeah, you see a lot of big data and artificial intelligence coming up. It, it, they want to become the world's primary AI innovation center by 230. Um, so a lot of a lot of capital is going in, a lot of startups being funded in that area. Um, yeah, a lot of I mentioned semiconductors briefly before. China imports upwards of 300 billion dollars worth of semiconductors every year. Um, but yeah, they want to fill the domestic need. They want to fund more companies in there. So startups obviously in that region um, are doing quite well. Um, communication equipment, domestic market, 1 billion internet users, everybody is communicating basically on a, on a consistent basis and software. Uh, we're still B2B software SaaS has been a bit slow. Um, there's still room for growth. Um, that Chinese companies embrace the latest technology. And I'm not talking about Alibaba and Tencent, but I'm talking about all the other companies who are doing a lot of business in China from a construction perspective, where obviously a lot more technology could go into them to just be much more faster, much more agile and cut costs uh, and, and you know, just really adopt to that change. As sort of a last point I want to quickly mention is what is the important factors for early stage investing, right? And now we've seen a lot of developments in, in Southeast Asia and China, where it's obviously on different waves, I would say, but it's still um, very interesting to look at that. And moving forward, this will even accelerate, right? More money will come into the market, uh, more technology will be used and will be demanded uh, and more dollars will, will fall into that category. So what, what is happening now? 
Um, I think from a founder perspective, it's all about managing the change. Right? And we've seen this in COVID. I mean, most of the most successful startups, they, they either didn't adopt to COVID or they were super fast in adopting to the COVID. Otherwise, you probably had challenges in terms of fundraising, you needed to raise bridge rounds, or even maybe didn't make it through the pandemic. And I think uh, England Tan from Insignia Venture Partners out of Singapore said that in a very nice way, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive. It's essentially those who can best manage change. Um, and I think moving forward, we should all have a long-term view. And especially if you invest in blockchain and uh, like all these emerging technologies where there's still room to grow, both from a regulatory perspective, but also from a pure product perspective. Um, it's about looking at the fundamentals of, of, of what, the, what the startup is solving, having that long-term view, being supportive as an investor and as a startup, look for these supporting investors who can add more to your cap table than pure um, allocation of, of financial resources. And just being lean and agile, I think, um, and we've seen this with office spaces becoming redundant because people work from home over you know, a lot of different devices. And that, that helps startups, right? Because you don't need to be in, in Singapore anymore. You don't need to be in Silicon Valley anymore. You don't need to be in Shanghai anymore. Um, you can basically operate from everywhere and just using you know, a lot of different technology providers and service providers to enable you to stay on a contact communication, which also increases the, the pressure, right? Because you're now working 24-7, you're working literally every day because you know, if, you're, if your team is everywhere and if you're everywhere, and you have access to all the resources, um, you know, that, that sort of falls in, in a very different category of work, in my opinion, which offers a lot of doors, but also makes things um, uh, more pressurized and, and just more challenging, but it's always a pro and con. And I think that sort of summarizes it, um, the point that I'm trying to make. And all in all, I'm extremely bullish about that part of the world. I think you will see a lot of growth moving forward. Um, and um, yeah, I'm excited to, to just meet a lot more founders and investors in that space and discuss about interesting trends. That was just a short overview of what China and the Southeast Asia space and especially early stage investing. Um, of course, there's a lot more to add to that. Um, but yeah, especially those markets I mentioned like the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, but also China. I think there's a, a lot of growth potential moving forward in different areas and different categories, but um, it will be one of the most impressive and fast growing markets moving forward and able a lot of growth and a lot of um, money being made in those markets for both founders and investors. Happy to reach out to at uh, my email, toby at blockchainff.com. On LinkedIn, you can find me on Tobias Bauer, my normal name. I'm also on Twitter um, and, and any other platform basically as well. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, if you have any questions, want to get in touch, feel free to ping me on, all these, on one of these channels and I'm happy to have a discussion or see if there's a way we can collaborate. So yeah, appreciate it. And thank you so much.